Thanks for joining us today. We really hope that this ministry has impacted your life and blessed your heart. And if it has, we would love to hear your story. Send us an email. Tell us about you. Send an email to stories at edgewaterchurch.com. And also, if you'd like to partner financially with this ministry, you may do so at our website, edgewaterchurch.com. Or you can download the app through the iTunes Store or through Google Play. Again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for watching today. Now prepare your hearts for the message. relationship goals. I want to kind of set the stage for this four-part message series. Uh, we're going to start in God's Word. So let's start in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18, where it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I just, I just can never, I can't get through that verse with a straight face just because every time I read it, I just think that God's up there going, Yeah, guys, you're not good on your own. You, <laughs> you, you, you shouldn't be left to your own devices. You need, you need someone to keep an eye on you. So anyhow, it goes on and says, uh, I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, This one is bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So today we're starting a message series, like I said, called Relationship Goals. If you're on social media at all, uh, I don't know how it is for you. You look across Facebook, you look across Instagram, and, and in your feed, there's always, there's always that couple, you know, that couple that it seems like every picture they put up, it's candlelight dinners, or it's, it's walks in the park, or date night, or trips together, or whatever. And, and a lot of times these days, you'll see the little hashtag relationship goals, all right? And so it, and it may not be what life is like every day, but it's something to strive for. We want to continue to grow and get better in our relationships. Because while those pictures are nice, I'm sure that there's a lot that goes on in real life that doesn't necessarily make it on social media. We don't often get to see the pictures of, of hurt feelings or anger. You don't see behind the scenes where there may be bitterness or mistrust or fights about money. Sometimes there's a, a lack of unity about how to raise the kids. There, there, are, there are people, two people that are just kind of doing their own thing without a sense of common vision. But it's my hope that today, that we want to do something different. We want to do something better. And that's why we have this, this series called Relationship Goals. We're going to look at four goals that I, I feel that we should have in order to have relationships that truly honor God. And so week one, number one today, where we're going to start, we're going to talk about our first goal, and that is to be Christ-centered. Let me hear you say Christ-centered. Christ-centered. Um, being Christ-centered is a lot different than just calling yourself a Christian. Because you can have two people in a relationship that, that call each other Christians, but just because you call yourself a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that, that you are Christ-centered in the way that you live. All right, you hear that? You, you may call yourself a Christian, but, but just because we, we may call ourselves Christians, we may not be Christ-centered in the way that we live. It, it can, can be two different things. So we, so we want to be Christ-centered. When we're Christ-centered, we tend to become then mission-driven. And the problem is so many of us are driven uh, kind of maybe in our own directions in separate ways or maybe sometimes in the wrong way. Uh, but we want to be led by the power of God to, to care about that which God cares about. 
Uh, we, we, the second goal then is to kind of be mission driven in our marriages. Third week, we're going to talk about being devil kicking. We need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle and our spiritual battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities in the dark world and that our spouse is never, ever our enemy. All right, but, but we do have an enemy that's out there that is in direct opposition to everything that matters to God. And so we're going to learn to stand together and we're going to learn to fight together against the schemes of the evil one. And so we're going to be Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, and we are covenant-keeping. Because we don't enter into a contract in marriage, we enter into a holy covenant. So we're going to learn a little bit more about what that means and how to honor God with that. So that's kind of the direction we're going in this. Um, So let's read these out loud together, just kind of the four goals that we have. Ready? Here we go. We want to be Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, covenant-keeping. One more time. We want to be Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil kicking and covenant keeping. So what does it mean to be Christ-centered in our marriages? What does it mean to be Christ-centered just in our lives in general? It's it's a good question. So we need to kind of start with the understanding um, that, that no matter who we are, no matter what our relationship status may be, all of our lives are centered around something. Each and every one of us, our lives are centered around something. If you're married, your marriage is centered around something. Your life is centered around something. If you're not married, your life is centered around something. So think about it. What is your life centered around? Those of you who are married, you may be married to somebody else, but maybe your marriage is really centered around you. It's centered around yourself. What I want. You're not meeting my needs. I'm upset with you. You're not doing what I want to do. Maybe your marriage is centered around your, your kids. You know, we, we, hey, kids, we're going to do whatever you want to do, whatever you want to get involved in. We're not necessarily going to invest in our marriage because it's all about you, kids. And so then what happens, you, you take them to all these activities for all these years, and then they go and leave the house. And then all of a sudden, you're looking at this stranger over here, and you're going, well, where the heck did you come from? And, and, and what on earth are we, are we going to do? Because you've never really invested because your life was centered around your kids. For some folks, our lives are centered around money or material things or success or your career or your image. We, we want to show everybody that, that, that's looking from the outside, hey, everything's great, everything's okay, I think things are really good, but maybe on the inside we're really messed up. But we're going to try to show you that we have this amazing, you know, happy marriage, this materially blessed life. It, our lives are centered around something. Sometimes we, we see those pictures, those relationship goals things, and we, and we set up those ideals, and we're like, man, I want that, I want that. I want every, every meal that I have, I want it to be a candlelight meal, you know? And we set up these, these crazy ideals. And sometimes that leads us to, to fall into the trap of the myth of the one, okay? The myth of the one. Many people wrongfully believe kind of this truth that's out there in our, this cultural truth that's out there, that in order to really have kind of a fulfilling life, if you really want to be happy in life, if you really want to be all that you're supposed to be and have all the meaning you're supposed to have, you are supposed to find the one. You've got to find the one, the perfect one. Uh, the, to be really happy, fulfilled in life, you have to find that one that makes you all goose bumply and tingly wingly inside, you know, and uh, where, where it's like, oh, now all the love songs on the radio make sense, you know. You've got, you got to find that one and, and every time you're together, there's this, you feel this special little bond, and so you've got to find the one. So a girl meets a guy, and he's kind of cute, and he opens up the car door for her, and she's like, he's the one. And I mean, I think he went to church like once in the 90s, maybe, and, and, but, but at least he has a job. You know, my last three boyfriends, they all wanted to be professional video game players. But this guy, he has a real job. He is the one, you know. We all need to recognize and realize that you do not need another person to complete you. You do not need another person to complete you. All right, being single is okay. I'm not really good at math, but last time I checked, one is still a whole number. <laughs> all right, so, so that, that's, that's all right. That's all right, Jesus had a pretty good run without a spouse, okay? He pretty much pleased God in amazing ways. We don't need another person to complete us. Jesus completes us, and he helps us to be able to do what it is that he calls us to do. So for those of you who are here today, and and you may not be married, um, and maybe you don't want to get married, or maybe you do want to get married, if you, if maybe someday you're hoping to get married, here's the thing. I would love it if one day when you meet that really amazing person, instead of saying, I think I met the one, we wanted you to say, I think, I think I met the two, all right? Because in a Christ-centered marriage, Jesus is your one, 
and your spouse is your two. Okay, when our marriages are truly centered around Christ, not just in word, but in the way that we actually live it out, then, then we're all about Jesus and everything else flows directly out from him. In fact, we mentioned uh, this verse last week in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, where Jesus said, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. In other words, we're going to put God first. God's going to be at the center. At the center of all that we do, God's going to be the most important thing in my life. And why, why does that matter? We talk about that a good bit around here. Why, why is it really important? Why am I talking about being Christ-centered? Again, let me, let me just remind you when I said earlier that everyone has something that's at the center of your life. Everybody has something that's at the center of your life. So um, I'm going to ask you to think maybe what is it for you? So, so think about your life for a second then kind of in concentric circles here. So you start off where you've got that thing at the center. Um, so, so whatever is at the center of your life it then begins to drive your values and beliefs. So what you value, what you believe, is kind of determined and shaped by what's at the center of your life. So you've got your values and beliefs. Your values and beliefs then impact your actions and decisions. Okay, what, what you value and what you believe becomes what you do, so it makes your actions and decisions. And your actions and decisions then determine your influence and your impact on the world around you. Okay, so it kind of goes out like that in concentric circles. And, and, that, and that influence and impact kind of determines a sense of, of fulfillment in our lives. So what is your life or what is your marriage centered around? Again, like I said earlier, it could be yourself. You, you could be the one at the center of your life. It, it could all be, be about you. But if, if it is, if your life is centered around you, I promise you that your influence and impact will be incredibly limited. Okay, it, it, it could be about your kids. Maybe if, you, if your kids are at the center of everything and everything else, all your values and beliefs and your actions and decisions, it, it's all determined by, by the fact that you, you have kids, then more than likely your marriage is going to suffer and, and you're not going to be able to fully please God with that expression of family to have the impact that you want to have. It could be your lifestyle. Maybe something in your lifestyle is that central thing. But, but for those of you who, who want something different, you, maybe you want something better, deeper relationship goals, your life could be centered around Christ. Okay? When you are Christ-centered, then Jesus, the Son of God, ultimately then impacts your values and beliefs. And then Jesus then begins to help determine your actions and decisions, your behavior changes. And, and then that then, your, your, the influence and impact then just explodes exponentially. And so, so if your life, if your marriage, if it's not centered around Christ, then you've got the wrong goal driving your relationship. There's the wrong thing at the center, which then influences everything else. Now, to those of you who may not be married right now, uh, maybe again, maybe that's something you're saying, hey, that's something I want in the future. Um, let me just say this to you. If you want a Christ-centered relationship in the future, live a Christ-centered life today. Okay, if you want to honor God with putting him first in future marriage, then honor God by putting him first today. I, I, you, we run into people, you know, where they say, uh, oh, well, once I find that person, that soulmate forever, then, then we're going to serve in the church, and then we're going to get our lives together. We'll, we'll, we'll do it all then when we, when we get together. But, but you know what? Now it's, it's, it's my time. I'm going to do what I want. Um, I've got, it's my time. I've got my needs. Um, I'm going to party right now. I'm going to do my thing. But here's the thing. Anytime you do your thing apart from God, that's always called sin. All right, it's always called sin. It's been said that you don't build a life of righteousness in the future on a foundation of sin today. You don't build a life of righteousness in the future on a foundation of sin today. So, so if you want something like that in the future, then embrace it today. Hey, I'm not waiting for somebody else to come along and, and finish me so I can start serving Jesus then. I'm serving him now. I'm following him now. I'm living a Christ-centered life now. I'm loving the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. So there's a big difference again between calling yourself Christian and living a Christ-centered life. You don't want to build a life of righteousness in the future based on a um, foundation of sin today. So how do we do it? Okay, if we want to be, be Christ-centered in all that we do, we want to be Christ-centered in our marriages, um, 
I, I could give you a whole long list of things. I, lots of good things, good ideas, good suggestions. If you're anything like me, a lot of times if I get a long to-do list, I, I don't do anything because <laughs> it, it just gets overwhelming. I look at it and go, oh man, where do I start? I can never get it all done, so I'm not even going to bother. And so I could give you this long list of things that you could do. I, I, I could say, hey, you need to read your Bible together, which is important. You need to go to church together. You need to be serving in church together. You need to learn to forgive each other. You need to learn to submit to one another in love. You need to, to, to rejoice in one another. You need to learn to show love and respect to one another. I could give you that whole list, but then you may go, man, that's a lot to do. And then, and then you, by the time you get back home from lunch, you, you, you've forgotten it all anyhow. So, so I'm going to try a little bit of a different strategy today. I'm going to give you one. All right? I'm going to give you one thing. One thing. One thing that, that gives you the highest value, the highest impact, and, and it's a thing that tends to lead to, to other things. It's kind of the linchpin. And so I want you to start here and do this. Uh, I want to give you this, this highest return action that, that can help you to become Christ-centered in your relationship. And if you do this one thing, it will help you to become Christ-centered in your marriages. And I'm sure right now you're like, all right, spit it out already. Just tell me the one thing. I'm like building it up. To you. So here's, here's the one thing. I would suggest that you very simply commit to pray together daily. Pray together daily. Now, just, just a short prayer every single day, because I believe that this one action can help to lead to other actions that will, that will really truly give you a Christ-centered relationship. This is the starting point, I believe. Now, in this holy moment here, as we're talking about prayer, let me just acknowledge that there are probably some of you who are thinking right now, oh man, I don't want to pray with my spouse. I wish I'd have skipped church today, you know? <laughs> And, and hey, I, I, I understand because sometimes it, it's an intimate thing and it's something maybe if you're not used to and, and prayer is something that's, that can be very personal or maybe we don't feel comfortable doing it very much, especially not out loud. And so we're like, oh man, or maybe maybe your spouse has been asking you to do it for the last 150 years and you've, you've just said no and, and you're like, oh man, and he's talking about it today. But I'll tell you what, this is one of the most underutilized tools to create true spiritual strength. I, I think that if I were the enemy, this would be what I would do. I, I would try to keep every Christian couple from praying together. Because if I can keep them from praying together, I can keep them from bonding together spiritually. I can keep them from becoming more mission-driven. And they're, and they're not going to be together in prayer, so they're probably not going to be devil-kicking. They're probably going to be getting kicked by the devil. You know? and, and then ultimately, they won't be covenant-keeping. Because you see, when you, when you pray together, you bond it's really hard to do bad things and be mad at the other person when you know you're going to have to pray with them later, you know? And so, so think about this. You're, you can't really fight and pray at the same time. You, you kind of have to resolve things. And so, so somehow this empowers you, encourages you, emboldens you to work through some issues so that you can truly have intimacy together. Okay? And so it's important for us to, to, to take this step, to... to because, what, again, what's going to happen is it can lead to other things. So maybe because you, you've been praying together, maybe you just start talking about spiritual things more often together because you prayed together. Maybe you end up moving in a spiritual direction with your kids more because you prayed together. Maybe you might start talking a little bit about what you read in your devotions. Maybe you might even start doing like the same devotional plan. Uh, you don't have to do it together. Maybe you're doing it separately. Maybe you end up doing it together. Who knows? It's all starting because you pray together. Chances are pretty good then that you're going to be in church together, that you're going to be serving together, okay? that you actually start being mission-minded together. Whenever you're under attack, you're going to realize, hey, we're under spiritual attack, and so you're going to, you're going to bond together. You're going to fight back together. It's amazing what happens when you truly take the time to pray together. Couples that pray together stay together. There was an article in Psychology Today um, that talked about how attending church together increases satisfaction in life. That praying for your partner increases your satisfaction and decreases the risk of dissolution. So, so praying for each other increases satisfaction, reduces the chances for divorce. So let me give you kind of three just really quick, easy thoughts about how to pray with your spouse. The first thing is, let me make it easy for you, is keep it short. Okay, it, it, we're not talking about saying first thing you do is you get into an hour-long intercessory prayer session. All right, that, that's not what we're, if you're doing that already, 
rock on, keep it up. But, but if you're not, you, I'm not saying you got to start there. Okay, how about, how about 60 seconds? How about 30 seconds? Start with 30 seconds, praying together every single day. Because if you do that enough, it could grow into two minutes. It could grow into five minutes. It could grow into an hour. Who knows? But, but it's never going to be an hour if it's not first 30 seconds. So, so start there. Start there. Just, so let's take some of the pressure off. Don't, don't feel nervous about it. Let's just join hands for 30 seconds a day, a minute, whatever you want, and just say, Jesus, please be at the center of our marriage. Okay? So keep it short. Second thing, keep it consistent. In other words, we're, we're going to do it a certain time every single day. This is our prayer time. And then if you miss a day, which you probably will, don't miss two. Okay, if you miss a day, don't miss two. So, so keep it short. We're uniting. We're together. Keep it consistent. Um, sometimes you may want to just make it, you pray before something happens, okay? Because again, that can become a cue that can lead to a habit and other good things. Um, like in, at our house, uh, we always pray before dinner. So no matter what's going on, we'll, we'll, we'll pray before dinner. And then I'll, I'll tuck Shaney in bed at night and, and we pray then. Okay, and so we, we don't miss dinner or bedtime that we're not praying together. All right, so, so maybe that's something for you. Maybe you want to uh, pray as you head out the door in the morning. Just a quick little prayer before you go. You might want to pray. The easy thing to do is before a meal. Okay, maybe, maybe then it'll become that you, as things come up, you'll just begin to develop that culture of, of praying. That maybe you, you've got to have a conversation with one of the kids. You pray before that. Um, you have a difficult presentation at work. You've got an interview for a new job. When you hear bad news, before you face the bad news, you just develop that habit of, okay, we're going to pray together first because that's what we do. Now, again, it's an intimate thing. There's, there's some who are saying, you know, I don't, I don't pray out loud. I don't know what to say. Well, let me help you out with that. Um, Craig Rochelle posted a simple prayer online, and, um, and so I'm gonna, we're going to put it up on the screen, and if you want to take a picture of it with your phone or write it down or something so you have it, I want to encourage you to do that. Go ahead and throw it on up there. Um, and so, so this is just something easy. It's not a magic words, but, but let's, let's pray this prayer together. Ready? Here we go. Dear God, give us wisdom and clear direction in all we do today. Help us to show your love to each other and shine your light into the world. Keep us close to you, away from temptation, and always in your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Simple, easy. I mean, even if you just have something in front of you, it may help you to, to, to ease into it. And then you may find, after a while, maybe you're adding your own words to it. Maybe you're making it a little longer. Maybe then you pray for maybe some specific things that you want to pray for. And before long, you're going to wake up and realize, man, we are, we are more Christ-centered which has empowered us to be more mission-driven, which has enabled us to be more devil-kicking, which then through and through we are covenant-keeping. And it started because we made the decision to pray together. So if there's one thing then that could help you to become more Christ-centered, which will help you to be more mission-driven, empower you to be devil-kicking, help you to be covenant-keeping, it's just going to take some time to join hands each day. Short prayer, simple, consistent, authentic, real. And that can be the beginning of not just calling yourself a Christian, but being Christ-centered in the way that you live. Now, I, I understand that um, for some, this may be kind of a sore subject, may be kind of painful because you're realizing it's something that you haven't done. Maybe, maybe one of the couple has been wanting to do it for a long time and has said something, and maybe it's caused some some pain in between. Uh, maybe neither of you have done it and you, you kind of are feeling guilty about it. And just set all that aside and just know that you can start again today. Even if you've been married for 50 years, you, you can start doing this today and it can make a difference for you. Take the time to pray. Just commit together. Talk about it on the way home. Just go, hey, let's do this. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. We'll just, we'll just read that little prayer that Dan put up there, and, and we'll do it uh, just in, when we wake up in the morning before we leave. We'll just read this prayer together. Start there, and it's going to be amazing to see what God does in your life when we begin to make ourselves more and more with Jesus at the center of our life 
and then and then how he influences all of those different spheres till till we get to the point where we find that he's he's just all throughout our lives everywhere we go and it's all going to start when we begin to pray together so let's do that right now please pray with me god thank you for this time i thank you for all these folks that you have gathered here god i pray that you will help us to be more christ-centered and and that it can start with just something as simple as just praying every day if we're married praying together with our spouse if we're not married right now just making sure we have that connection with you every day that we are christ-centered in how we live that we let you be on the center in the center of our lives that influences our beliefs and values and our actions and decisions and then changes our influence and impact and fulfillment so God, I pray that you'll help us to have that diligence to do it every single day, to create that habit. And God, I pray that if there have been hurts or disagreements along these lines, I pray that you'll just make us unified. Get us moving in the same direction. Help us take the chance, take the risk to pray together every day. Well, maybe you're here today and talking about having Jesus in the center of your life is something you, you haven't done before. You've always been at the center of your life. And I just got to tell you that um, we don't have the vision or the, the plan that, that, that God has or the, the power or the ability to love and the, the depths of compassion that, that come from having him at the center of our life. And so maybe today is the day that you want to take that step to start to follow Jesus. So we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. One of the ways we do it around here is just through a simple prayer. So I'm going to pray and I invite you to repeat it after me, phrase by phrase. Just repeat after me and pray, Dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. Please forgive me of all I've done wrong. Be at the center of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.